to the world, Billy Bean's decision should have been easy. Twelve and a half million. I, that's inc- and he wouldn't have to live in Silicon Valley anymore, where the price of living here is crazy, right? I, do you have relatives living outside of the state who are like, why are you still there? Do you know you could buy six houses here in Indiana for what you pay? There? And I'm like, yeah, but then I'd have to live in Indiana. And uh, yeah, nothing against it. my husband's <laughs> Okay, he lived in Indiana. But, um, well, I will t- tell you this. Uh, he, for years, prayed. He said, God, I'll go anywhere but California. He's from Florida. He said, because to him, everybody in California were just a bunch of weirdos, right? And he goes, I'll go anywhere but California. And I said, I won't tell God where I won't go, but I really prefer not to live in Florida. And what kind of weather are we having recently? It's like we are right here in Miami. I'm, I'm, yes. So my theory is every time it gets above 95 degrees, I should get a break on my property taxes because I pay so much money to live here because of the weather. But um, so far, San Jose City has not called me back. Uh, but, you know, when we look at that, his decision should have been easy. You know, $12 million versus whatever the Oakland A's were going to give him. But then he said, When his daughter says, you know, if you move away, just know that you were a great dad. And relationship messes up money every single time when we let it. And I want to live a life that is messed up by relationships. Money is simple. Relationships make us crazy. I was asked a couple of years ago how I pick the topics for the books that I write. Uh, a woman who is a MOPS mentor, and MOPS is mothers of preschoolers, and the mentors, are these are women who um, have already done the preschool thing and now are hopefully there to guide and advise women who have younger kids. And so this was a MOPS mentor, and she said, how do you pick the topics of your books? And I said, well, I just think about whatever I have totally blown, whatever I'm terrible at, whatever has made me feel like a failure, And when I learn a little something on that topic, I write and I share it with women to give them a little bit of hope. That's what I do. So I have to be completely messed up and totally wrong before I can write on a subject. And what she said to me was, I was there speaking on my book with the title that most people relate to. And that book is called, I Need Some Help Here, Hope for When Your Kids Don't Go According to Plan." Um, I find that a very relatable topic. And she goes, oh, she goes, well, I never really had any problems with the parenting thing. I figure you just do what you're supposed to do and love them and they all turn out great. She honestly said that to me. So my first thought was, please don't write a book because nobody wants to hear that, uh, you know, suck it up, buttercup, and just do what you're supposed to do and your kids will turn out fine. And two, uh, we can't be friends uh, because... Why would I want to hang out with somebody who had done everything perfectly and raised perfect kids? And so I write out of my messiness because I figure my most impactful messages are the ones where I've been in a mess, God has thrown me a lifeline, whether it's through another person, through his word, through through some kind of understanding. It's usually all three. And then I say, you know what? I don't know everything, but here's something that's helped me and I want to pass it along to you. And that's what I'm here today with as we're going through the parables and we're talking about the rich fool. Because um, I haven't been the rich part, but I've been the fool part. And I do believe that if we are living in San Jose, California today in the year 2015, we do, get to, we do have to apply the rich title to us as well. I may not look rich according to um, San Jose standards, but according to world standards, and um, so many of us have been to Nicaragua, uh, where, you know, when we look at that, we can't help but understand that the biblical application of rich applies to each and every one of us. Uh, and today what we're talking about is stuff. We're doing a whole parable on stuff. And stuff has been a big portion of my life. My dad is literally what you would call a hoarder. Uh, He had a a garage that you went from, when you went to, to the front door of the garage, there were two paths. There was one to his desk 
in the garage, his workbench, and there was one to the mailbox. Anything else, you'd be dead. Like, if you moved anything else, things would fall on you and you would be dead. And I already see people nudging each other, so you know somebody like this, right? Um, I, I thought I was a pretty small minority until a bunch of people came up to me after first service and said, my mom, my dad, my sister, my daughter, my son. Um, nobody came up to me and said, oh, I'm that. No, <laughs> I realize that now. But um, we can see it in others. You know, it's so much easier, you know, my treasures are what Roger calls my stuff and vice versa. And so, you know, it's so much easier to see it in somebody else than to recognize it in ourselves. But I think um, clutter is really anything that keeps me from living the life that God has designed for me to live. And that's when I have abundance of stuff that doesn't bring me joy, I don't use, and I wouldn't buy again. These are three criteria that I think when we're talking about stuff, um, clutter, that we can really apply. If you don't love it, you know, it doesn't make you happy when you see it. I have uh, a, a little drawing on my refrigerator where my niece has written, I love you, Kathy. And she spelled Kathy K-A-P-H-E-E. And it just brings me joy every time I see it. That's not clutter. That's just love. I love that. Um, if I don't use it, and if I wouldn't buy it again, I consider that clutter. And um, it's not the emergencies that get us into trouble. It's the day-to-day. -day. You know, the day-to-day -day clutter. When we're in an emergency situation, we can see our priorities very quickly. About five or six years ago, uh, Roger was working from home. I was working from home. Our, it was the first day of college and high school for our kids, so they were scattered all over the place. And we have a pounding on our door, just a, a frantic pounding. And so we open up the door, and somebody's screaming at us, fire, fire, your house is on fire. You know, they always say, what do you value? You value what you would grab in a fire. So it turns out that we value our puggle Jake. And if you don't know what a puggle is, it's a pug beagle mix. Uh, I, was, I was so focused on getting him out of the house, I didn't even grab his leash. We gathered him up and went outside. Uh, now, how our house was on fire, we live in townhouses. So the townhouse two doors down was completely engulfed in flames. It was gutted. The next house had fire and smoke damage, and it was creeping steadily towards us. And God bless um, the San Jose Fire Department who live about two blocks from our house because they were there in the matter, a matter of in, an instant. But as we were standing outside, I had this little niggling feeling in the back of my head. And I said, Roger, Jeremy didn't come home, did he? Jeremy is Roger's son. And he said, no, we would have heard him. And then without saying another word, Roger takes off into the house. And he's running upstairs and he flings open the boy's bedroom and he screams, Jeremy, Jeremy. And Jeremy is there totally asleep on the bed saying, what? And Roger said, fire. And Jeremy said, okay. And so Roger is dragging him out of the house and gets him down. And we're all standing out there in our bare feet with our dog. Somebody had got us a leash. But we realized we were literally the people who grabbed the dog and left the kid in the fire. Roger would like me to reframe this as he was the one who went back into a burning building to save his child's life. I do not get to say that. But, you know, when you're in an emergency your situation becomes crystal clear. What are you going to save? Well, we were going to save our dog. That's because my husband knows how to back up our computers really well. Otherwise, I would have gone back in. But um, we, we knew what was important. We didn't know Jeremy was home. Otherwise, he would have been on the list too. But we know what's important. But it's the day-to-day. -day, it's the decisions, the millions of little decisions of stuff that we have to make. And if we don't get very, very clear on our thinking, we're going to get enveloped in this stuff, and it changes the way that we, do, that we live life. And I think that one of the reasons, at least I struggle with stuff so much, and I've been struggling with it for years, and we're finally starting to get a handle on it um, over the past several years. And that's why I, I wrote my book, and it's called Clutter Free. And it's talking about how do you deal with your stuff? Because I don't believe this is just 
a home issue. I don't believe that this is just a things issue. I believe that this is a spiritual issue. And we're changing the entire direction of our ministry. Roger and I speak at marriage conferences, parenting conferences, all these places. But we're changing almost everything to clutter-free because we're seeing what an impact it has on families because it's the day-to-day stuff. My friend Sherry Gregory was here at the first service, and she goes, I never thought about it, but my husband and I have never had an argument over the uh, what car we were going to buy, you know, the, the big decisions. But, you know, the, the $2 garlic press that he bought at the store, that's what we've had knockdown drag outs over. It's the day-to-day stuff that gets in the way. And so that's what I want to talk to us about today is the accumulation of stuff we have in our lives and what we do. it. And let me just be honest. I struggle with this still. I am addicted to office supplies. I love awesome office supplies so much. Anybody else... Now that you hear those words, addicted to office supply, anybody else struggle? Oh my goodness, you guys are so much more honest than the first group. Thank you. Thank you. They're like, well, maybe a little bit. Thank you for being hardcore. I appreciate that. Because when we tell the truth, we can heal. I love that. Okay, so what Sherry Gregory, who she and I have co-authored some books talk about, she called this buying to become. And that's exactly what I'm doing when I'm buying office supplies. I have to stay out of Office Depot. Like, that's my bar. That's my drug. It really is. It's not good. Because I think if I can just get the right size, right color post-it note, my life will be, thank you for saying yes. Thank you. I got, it's, it's close to an amen as you're going to get on a sermon like this. Um, if I can just find that right size, then everything's going to be organized. I'm buying to become more organized. And, or I am buying to become more educated. We accidentally ended up with 12 bookcases. Not 12 bookshelves, 12 bookcases. We had bookcases in our bathrooms. That's a problem, people. That's when you know you have issues. And I was buying books on business and on on, um, Bible education. The problem was I was buying and not always reading these books. I was, I thought if I, thank you, for, see, people are nodding, you guys, this, oh, I love you guys. Okay, because if I buy the book, that means that I have the intention of learning it, and that's almost as good as learning it, right? And so I was buying to become, and I had all these books that some were read and some weren't read, but I kept them as little trophies, as little treasures, like certificates of completion. Like, I have learned this. It's awesome. And then, um, women may understand this, buying to become led me to three closets of clothes. Because every time there was a new event or a new something, I needed a new outfit. And can I tell you, I've been teaching this stuff, I'm working on this stuff, how hard it was for me not to go out this week and buy a new outfit to talk today. It was, I mean, this was a struggle of will. It's something I struggle with, but I also now recognize that I'm doing it. Because as much as I love our church and feel included in our church, sometimes I don't always feel like I fit in our church. Just being honest, because I always look at people and they come in their Sunday best and they all look so put together. And I'm like, they have no issues. I'm the only one with issues. And then I sit down and talk to you with coffee and I realize, oh no, you've got just as many issues. It's awesome. I love you. We can be friends. So I know that I have done the buying to become. And so many of us have been in that place. You know, if I just have the right outfit, if I just have the right thing, if I just have the right anything. And once we buy to become, we have to deal with all that stuff. And I believe that that is a spiritual issue. And when it comes to getting rid of it, we are emotionally wrapped up in our stuff. It's so much harder. And there's so much that goes into that. And let me tell you some of the reasons I think it is very difficult for us to get rid of stuff. The first reason is guilt. We have guilt so-and-so gave it to me. You know, I can't get rid of it. They gave it to me. What if they come over and they don't see it? Then they're going to know I don't love them. You know, so we keep things from people we don't even like to prove that we love them. Um, Or I bought this book or bike or boat, and I really should use it. I feel guilty because I haven't used it yet. Um, Number two is shame. Shame. I can't believe I spent so much on X, a leather jacket, a piece of furniture. I really need to keep it to get, you know, I'm ashamed of how much I spent, so I need to make sure that I use it so I can get my money's worth. But 
I think the big one, and the one I want to talk to us about today, and the one that I think fits this parable so, so well, is fear. Fear. What if I need it someday? What? Okay, so I hear an amen over there. What if I regret giving it away? What if I don't have enough? And it's so interesting. When we go to Nicaragua, we see people who literally do not have enough. But then we come home, and I believe as humans, we have this big fear that we're not going to have enough of whatever it is. And I think really that's a spiritual issue for us. I think what we really don't have enough of is a relationship with God and others. But the easy fix, the easy feel, fill is to buy more stuff because stuff is easy. Stuff fixes things very quickly. And so I want to read to you the parable of the fool that we find in Luke 12, starting with verse 13. Let me read this to you. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me judge and or arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. I think it's interesting. He doesn't say be on your guard against greed. He says all kinds of greed. I, I, I love that he says that because greed doesn't just show up as not giving money to the poor. It shows up in a million different ways. It shows up in wanting to possess more than we need. It shows up in collecting and being, um, and I'm not saying all collecting is bad, but when we want to own so that others can't have, that is a form of greed. Beware of all, against, guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. God is very specific Jesus says very specifically, an abundance of possessions is not where life is found. And he told him this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whomever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. I think it's so interesting that God is talking specifically about what we are storing up here. And he's not just talking in a spiritual way or an emotional way. He's talking about our physical things. What are you storing up? He, he contrasts people who store things up for themselves versus those who are rich towards God. So, you know, so often we read these parables and we think, this has no application to my life today. This has no meaning and everything. This one has a direct application to who we are today. You're like, I don't have a barn. I'm not storing grain. Okay, we do have barns, and we are storing grain, which was the currency of that time. And let me tell you, we have a TV show that's dedicated to it that's been spinning off to a million different TV shows and a network that is practically showing this show 24-7. Do any of you recognize these guys? Okay, I am the only heathen here who watches reality TV. Good to know. We're in a very spiritual... This is Storage Wars. This is one of the most popular... Uh, t- shows on television right now. And what it is, if you don't know the premise, is these are, these are buyers who go to storage units. And what they do, these are storage units that people have put uh, their, their possessions in. And for some reason haven't been able to keep up on the rent of the storage. And so they go in with bolt cutters, cut the locks, lift the doors, and auction off somebody's life work, life's worth of contents for pennies on the dollar. It's a fascinating show. I'm not saying go watch TV. I'm just saying it's pretty fascinating to see what people spend their money to store. It goes all the way from household items to hundreds and thousands of dollars worth of artwork. It's really, really interesting to watch this show and see what has been abandoned by people. And you think about the lives of the people who have spent all this money to buy these possessions, and they lose it because they can't keep up with a $30, $40, $50 storage unit payment. I think it's fascinating. And, you know, we look at this guy who was the rich fool, and he has the same issue. He has the same issue as the people who have lost these storage lockers. He accumulated stuff so that he wouldn't have to work 
in his final days. But the irony is, the rich fool spent his final days building barns. He spent his final days working for his stuff, and he never got to use it or enjoy it. That's what happens with an abundance of stuff. Instead of the stuff serving us, we end up serving the stuff. How many of us spend time every single Saturday rearranging our stuff and cleaning our stuff and caring for our stuff? This is what it can look like when we have an abundance of stuff. How much richer would his life have been if instead of being rich in his barns, he had been rich towards God and said, God, how can I use this for your kingdom? And some of you are sitting here thinking, well, I don't have to worry about this. I'm not rich. This is not an issue for me. Trust me, I'm good. I understand that. But you know what? What I would say to that is we all have riches in, our sm- in a small way. You know, my dad wasn't rich. My- nobody would have considered my dad rich. But he was more comfortable with his stuff than he was with his relationships. And figuratively and literally, my dad built walls with his stuff between us, between him and the world. And so at some point, you know, as a child, you know, I remember when people ask me about my dad or I think about my dad, I don't think about us going to Disneyland together. I don't think about us going to the park together. I think about my dad at his workbench with his stuff. That's my major memory of my dad. And it's so easy as a child of a hoarder, you know, people ask me, do you watch that show? And I'm like, um, no, that's like family films for me. That's not what I need to be reflecting on. But I think about this, I, you know, when my kids see me watching TV, are they having to go through my stuff? And they see me at my computer, are they having to go through my stuff? They see me with a book in my hand. None of these things are bad, but what am I valuing more, the relationships or the stuff? It's so easy. It's such a fine line we have to watch because our stuff, when it serves us, it's a beautiful thing. But when we start to serve our stuff, when we have to pay attention to it, it gets in the way. So my question is, what are we supposed to do with our stuff? I really believe that God gives to us so generously so that we can be a part of his plan, so that we can then give to others, that we can then be a part of what God's purpose is for us here on earth, to not just love him, but to love his people and love others so generously and extravagantly that people can't help but say there's something different about that person. There's something different because... We love God, and I want to be known, I want Christians to be known as the most generous people on earth, not the wealthiest, but the most generous, that when something comes into our hands, how do we then distribute it to the people that are around us that God has assigned to us? So in the parable, Jesus is contrasting those who store up things for themselves and those who are rich towards God. So I want to look at what, what did he see as, what are the differences between those who store up things for themselves and those who are rich towards God? I think the people who store things up for themselves, one, they fail to calculate the cost of maintenance. It sounds so, you know, academic and like what we, but I think it's so true. You know, he had to spend his final days maintaining his stuff. And how many times have we wished for a bigger house because we have too much stuff? How much, you know, the, the bigger houses, the number one thing realtors say that people are looking for, I thought was going to be kitchens or bathrooms. It's storage. People want storage. They want places to put their stuff. And I think that there are really four things that we have to consider as we are accumulating stuff, what the cost is. Now, money is a cost, but there are four different kinds of costs. I think the first one is space. How much space am I having to allot to this stuff? How much of my house am I having to do towards this? We live in about 1,400 square feet. In the rest of the world, that's a pretty big place. Here in Silicon Valley, not so much. To Texas, they think that we're living in a one-room apartment. They think that that's hilarious that we live in such a, something so small. We have to manage our space so well. And when we get to a place where we just keep buying stuff and we think the only cost is money, That's where we get into trouble because all of this stuff builds barriers within the relationships we have in our homes. We have to be very, very careful about the the space that we are allotting to this. Uh, The second thing I think is time. You know, think about the time that you're having to commit to your stuff. The hours you had to work for that item. 
in order to, to be able to afford it. The hours you have to work to be able to store or maintain it. I think about some of the bigger things we have. We're going down to it being a one-car family. We're going to see how that impacts our relationship. That's going to be very interesting, I think. But we've just come to the conclusion that the more stuff we have, and I'm not suggesting people become a one-car family, especially if you have small children. The, um, you, you would hunt me down and kill me later on. I understand that. You need to get out of the house. But for us, it's going to work and it's less stuff we have to maintain space time energy how much energy are you using to maintain your stuff are you spending every saturday cleaning and rearranging your stuff what are you what are you committing to caretake for this stuff and then finally it's money i think money is the cheapest of them all really you know, it's so easy to go buy something at Target so quickly, but then think about the space, time, energy, and money that you're going to need to devote to that. It gives us a different perspective. Okay, so the first thing, we fail to calculate the cost of maintaining his stuff. The second is look to how the wealth will be, a fool looks to how the wealth will benefit him instead of the kingdom. And here's where I think that we get into big trouble, is when we look at everything we earn as ours, we get into big trouble. When we don't think about the tithing that God has said, I have blessed you with so much, I'm asking for 10% back. When we don't think of it in those terms, but we think of it as ours and we're giving, that's, it, that's not how we need to look at it. What we've been blessed with is what we've been entrusted with, and we need to get serious about that. And then also the other part of this is, you know, are we building our own kingdoms or God's? And so thinking about that as well, where do we get our security? Is it from having our stuff? The fool got his security saying, hey, I have enough wealth now that I never have to work again. I never have to, I can drink, eat, and be merry. And then three, he had the goal of doing nothing. His goal was to do, he had a goal of doing nothing. And I think that's so interesting because when we talk about Sabbath, that God has designed one day for us to rest, restore, and reconnect with him, we can't give that away. You know, I mean, you have to tie me down to make sure that I stay still for Sabbath. I don't want to be that person. I want to practice Sabbath on a regular basis. But then our national goal is at 65 to never have to do anything responsible again for the rest of our lives. And so think about the dichotomy. If we were given the opportunity to completely quit everything, we wouldn't know what to do with ourselves. So then he contrasts, Jesus contrasts that who, the person who stores up for himself versus those who are rich towards God. And I never really understood or heard the term rich towards God, but I think it's a mindset and it's how we've practiced our lives. And so it, it turns on the head of the rich fool. And the, the, those who are rich toward God ask themselves a set of different questions. And here are the questions they ask themselves. Number one, does this item build or break relationships? Several years ago, Roger said, would you do me a favor? Would you just write a bestseller so we could buy a cabin in the woods? I'm like, yeah, I'll get right on that. Yeah, I've been holding back, baby. You know, like I haven't done my best stuff yet. So I thought it was so funny that within two months of him joking around with me about that, one of my dearest friends in the world, Mary, wrote a book and it became a New York Times bestseller. And what did Mary and her husband do with that money? They bought a cabin in the woods. Like, well, okay, our friendship is over. I'm like, you have our cabin. That's not fair. I could have just as easily written that. Okay, no, I couldn't have. She did it. She did. But here is the difference between where Roger and I were at at that point and where Mary was at at that point. Within two months, she said, we bought this cabin in the woods. It's in Volcano, California. I didn't even know there was a Volcano, California. And she goes, and we want you and Roger to feel free to use it as a retreat anytime we're not using it. I'm like, okay, we can be friends. Okay, we can, friendship restored. I think, I really, really believe in the depths of my being, part of the reason that Mary and her husband were blessed with that abundance was because of her intention of how she was going to use it. She said, you know what? 
This isn't just about me. How can I build relationships with this? And I have seen them use that cabin in so many ways. It's been used as a pastor's retreat. It has been used to build relationships with their immediate family. And the number one reason they bought in that area was because her brother-in-law had a place in that area. And so they are building family relationships through it too. It's been used as a writing retreat center. It's been used as a ministry without ever having to have a tax deduction. She says, how can we use this to build the relationships in our lives? And she and I are closer, not just because of that, but because, you know, when we talk about when we're going up to the cabin and everything, our friendship has grown in other ways because we've said, okay, how can we bless them while we're there? And Roger put in the wireless system for them and so we could actually be there because we couldn't be there without a wireless system. It just doesn't work. Uh, But... I look at what their intention was. And now Roger and I have a dream of someday having a cabin in the woods. Maybe not as a second home, but as our primary home. But the question we've learned to ask because of Mary and her husband is how will we use this to build relationships? How will we use this to build God's kingdom? Okay, so the first question was, does this item build or break relationships? The second one is, does this item bless others or solely benefit me? Uh, I have a friend, Sandy, who they were looking for a new house. And she, one of their criteria was to have a swimming pool. Now, this blew my mind for a couple of different reasons. One, they're not ostentatious people. These are my friends. They have four compassion kids they sponsor. I, they're just kind of amazing. And, but, so they're not really into showing off. And so I'm thinking, why a pool? And then Mary, the other reason it kind of blew my mind, Mary doesn't know how to swim. She's never swam in her entire life. I'm like, this is the weirdest purchase. So I asked her, what's this all about? She said, well, you know, my husband and I were talking, and our youth pastor is always looking for a house to have uh, the youth group over. And Mary has little tiny kids. She, she doesn't have kids in the youth group. So she said, I thought we could be the house where they could come and hang out. And my friend Sherry, who was sitting here in the first service, she goes, that's why God didn't give me a big house. I don't want kids at my house. She goes, God has clearly gifted me in different ways. And, but, you know, I, I look at her heart, and she says, you know, when we're making a purchase, a huge purchase of her home, she says, how can we build the kingdom of God? And she wants to do that through a pool. By the way, she's taken swimming lessons because she thought if somebody gets hurt at her house, she wants to be able to dive in. She's really scared that that'll happen someday. She has not had to go into the pool yet, and she's very happy about that situation. But, you know, I love the thinking on that. How can what God has entrusted with us build the kingdom? I, it's so intentional. And that's the third question. Does this item add to king, God's kingdom or build my own? I think that that's a really interesting question. You know, am I buying this home because I want to impress others, or am I buying it because God can use this home? Can we dedicate our home, whether it's an apartment we're renting or a beautiful big home that can host, you know, fundraisers for compassion or whatever it is that God has intended you for, how can this home be dedicated to building God's kingdom? I think about so many generous people in my life who have said, hey, I want to be a kingdom builder. I think about uh, my friends Chris and Vicki Francis who used to go to this church and one day they showed up at my house and I was just on the brink of becoming a single mom, but they knew that I had a heart for writing and they said, we've been saving money and they handed me a box and it was a laptop computer. And I'll never forget that day because these are not rich people. You know what? The most generous people usually are not the ones that have the most. And I really honestly believe that what we do with $100 is what we would do with a million dollars. Your level of generosity doesn't go up by your income. Your level of generosity grows up by practicing generosity. This, this parable has so much for us, but in the end, I think the interesting thing that Jesus is teaching about is we never know the time or the day. We never know when our last moment is here on earth, and what are we working towards? Are we working towards the building bigger barns so that we can store our stuff, or are we working towards relationships? It was a very interesting couple of weeks. We all know by looking at the news. You know, there was... Um, 
there was a shooting on a beach where 38 people lost their lives while they were on vacation uh, internationally. We, we saw the Wednesday night Bible study where nine saints lost their lives at the end of an hour of loving on God and praising God and reaching out to somebody. And Roger and I had, um, we were in one of those ripped from the headlines kind of situations last week. Last Thursday was our 10th wedding anniversary. And we were so excited to be able to celebrate with each other because a 10 may not sound like a big number, but we're a blended family, so we count those as dog years. So it's really 70 for Roger and I. And uh, we had, this, is, this was a bucket list item. We've always wanted to go on an Alaskan cruise. So we, we put the money down. We said, we're going to do this, and we went. And on Thursday the 25th, our 10th anniversary, we were in our cabin, and they were making announcements for the people who hadn't gotten back on the boat yet. And just a couple of nights before, there was somebody who was delayed about an hour and 20 minutes. They held up one of the boats that was going back. And it was this 20-something who kind of flitted onto the boat, not a care in the world, not knowing that she kept almost 2,000 people waiting because she decided to do a little extra shopping. So we thought it was the same kind of situation. They kept announcing names, announcing names. And then Roger noticed that they started announcing different names. They started to announce names that sounded a lot like the names they were announcing before, but slightly different. They were announcing family members' names. And we decided to go up on the observation deck. There was not going to be a lot going on. And we got up there. There were about 50 people there. And we started, uh, we were actually, I, I, I don't say this to sound holy, we were actually doing Bible study while we were up there. Um, that's because we left early to go shopping that day. So that evens it all out. And um, so we were up there and we were Bible reading and, um, and talking with each other. And they came on and they made an announcement. And um, Roger got a picture of this float plane earlier that day. Um, there was a float plane that had gone out on a morning run and never came back. And they didn't know what had happened. It had eight passengers from our cruise on it, and the pilot, obviously. And um, so we stopped and prayed. And, just, you know, we didn't know what else to do. They were missing. They, had, they didn't know what was going on. They hadn't come back. And right next to us, there was a woman, and she started to have kind of a breakdown. And so Roger had a bunch of napkins, and he passed them over to her. And uh, so after she was, she kind of regained some composure, I, I started talking to her, and she said, um, we had tickets to be on that float plane. And um, I, I asked her if I could take a picture. I'm like, here's the worst moment of your life. Do you mind if I capture a snapshot? Because I'm speaking on Sunday. Um, but her name was Debbie. And she, her 13-year-old son, and her mom were supposed to be on that plane. And from what we can guess, um, she was supposed to be, the, the reason they canceled her flight was because her plane never came back. And... Uh, when we talk about not knowing the time or day, we don't know the time or day. Later that night, we were celebrating at dinner, and they came over the loudspeaker, the captain, you've never heard a room go silent so quickly in your life. And all eight of those uh, passengers, including, and the pilot, um, had crashed into the side of a hill and lost all of their lives. And we were talking with some of the crew members um, later on, and they, we said, you know, has anything like this ever happened before? And they said, absolutely not. You know, some of these crew members had been on this, this same boat 12, 13 years. They said, in fact, statistically, you're more likely to die on the way to the cruise ship than you are in anything like this. And I think about what happened when we heard that there had been an accident. You know, we were up on the observation deck, and there were about 50 of us. And after we talked with Debbie and we heard more about her story, I said, Roger, look around the room. And it went from 50 people to over 200 people. You know, it was interesting. When there was a tragedy, people were looking for other people. They wanted to be with other people. And it was a very strange situation because none of us knew who was in the accident or what had happened. But we think about what are we working so hard for? You know, and the enemy of generosity, the enemy of relationships is someday. Someday, 
I will have enough money saved that I can spend time with my family. Someday, I will have enough money that I can give to the organizations I care about. Someday. And if, if that cruise taught us nothing else, one, we were so glad. There was no financial reason that we should have gone on that cruise. It was a stupid decision on our part. We're so glad we went because we want to invest in our relationship. And that's the, I keep pointing over here because that's my husband, Roger, and that's the, rela- that's the relationship I want to invest the most in here on earth. But I know this, whatever God has seen fit in, in his way to trust us with, I want to be on target, responsible to say, God, what do you want me to show up for? I want to be generous towards God. I want to be, when people see how we handle our money and our relationships, I want people to see that there is something different because God is an active part in our lives. Whatever you're doing with the $100 in your bank account today, that's a reflection of what you'll do with the million that God may someday entrust you with. How are you handling what he's given you today? Don't wait. Don't build bigger barns. Nobody needs your bigger barns. What they need is to see. They need your relationships. They need you. They need to see that our faith lived out makes a difference in this world. Whatever small thing I have now, God, how can I use my home, my car, my pool, my barbecue to build your kingdom? Can I sell off the excess, the things I bought to become something? Can I sell those off and put that towards building relationships in my life and building God's kingdom? I want to be generous now so that whatever God trusts me with a year from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, there'll be a reflection of who God is in my life. Will you guys pray with me? God, we thank you so much for everything that you give us, everything that you trust us with. God, I pray that we would not build bigger barns, but that we would build relationships. That when people see us and how we handle our money, how we handle our relationships, they would say there is something different because you live in us. God, we want to be excellent stewards because we know that that comes from you loving us and then loving a world who desperately needs you. Thank you for everything you trust us with. God, we, may we be trustworthy of everything you hand to us. In Jesus' name, amen.